100 years. Before we delve into the more distressing and nefarious pieces of hidden media, let us first begin with something a little more light-hearted and entertaining. Something which stems from the entertainment industry itself, Hollywood. As crazy as it may seem, an experimental film with promotional connotations has been made and is due to be released 92 years from the date of this upload. The feature, titled 100 Years, with accompanying tagline, The Movie You Will Never See, is rumored to be an obscure science fiction film written by and starring American actor John Malkovich and directed by acclaimed filmmaker Robert Rodriguez, whose portfolio includes the likes of Sin City, Desperado, and the Spy Kids franchise. The mysterious movie has also been produced by the French cognac firm Remy Martin as a means to promote their new Louis XIII brandy. It is a strange but potentially genius form of advertising, one may say, as it relates to the length of time it takes to create a bottle of said drink. Originally produced and advertised in 2015, the film has a future release date of November 18th, 2115, and has sparked much speculation, gossip, and intrigue. It's no secret that certain art pieces, whether it be the Leonardo da Vinci paintings, to basic easter eggs contained in popular box office movies, incorporate hidden messages or secrets about history, society, and of Hollywood itself. So with this in mind, the plot, meaning, and justification for its distant release is something that film buffs are discussing online, in the hope that they may find out what all the fuss is about before we die. Another interesting aspect of the film is that it promotes a small, international ensemble cast, including Taiwanese actress Shoya Shang and Chilean actor Marco Zaro. Does this mean that it is intended to reach a worldwide audience? Rodriguez, who credits 100 years as some of the best work he has ever done, stated in a 2019 interview that he has produced both a commercial and feature film with the French cognac giant, confirming that I was making several short films for them and then I showed them the movie, and they said, yeah, that's great. That's the one we lock away. So what do we actually know about the movie itself? John Malkovich, the legendary actor, was cast as the male protagonist, with Chang as the aptly named female protagonist. To cap things off, Marco Zaro is introduced as the antagonist of the piece, whose plot and visuals were partially teased by a few short trailers, titled Retro, Nature and Future, the rest of it remains top secret, so much so that the role of the film is currently being kept within a high-tech safe behind bulletproof glass that will open automatically on its official date of release in the year 2115. It is also reported that 1,000 specially selected guests from across the globe, including its stars, have been given a pair of tickets, which are apparently made of metal to prevent damage or expiration for the film's premiere. Although they will not get to participate or attend personally, they can pass these down to their friends or family. Could this be a massive publicity stunt designed to generate hype, promotion, and advertising for a particular brand of cognac? Or does the film contain a vision of the future, something which the world is not ready to see, but may understand and recognize when the time comes after its eventual release? One thing is for sure, whoever is watching this YouTube video in the year 2023 will not get to see it. The Station Nightclub Fire Let's get a little darker and turn our attention to the unfortunate and more troubling piece of lost media that are making the rounds on the internet. The Station Nightclub Fire, which occurred on February 20th, 2003, in West Warwick, Rhode Island, was a terrifying disaster that destroyed the nightclub, killing 100 people and resulting in many seeking closure in the form of an audio recording. The night occurred as any other, the station nightclub was packed due to the announcement that 80s rock band Great White were headlining the venue. An evening that promised a plethora of fun, laughter, and nostalgic music. Around 11pm, the band took to the stage and began their set, that included a pyrotechnic display. This was the catalyst for the horror that would unfold, as the sparks ignited the foam proofing and eventually engulfed the stage and surrounding areas. After the realization that this was not part of the show, the terrified guests headed for the nearest exit, 
but unfortunately, despite alternative exits being available to escape, the crowd in their panic became too congested, and 100 people, including Great White's lead guitarist, Ty Longley, never made it out alive. Another person to perish that fateful evening was Matthew Pickett, a 33-year-old music lover and collector of retro items, who, according to his fiance, gave so much of himself, even if he had nothing. Having celebrated seven years of sobriety, and having proposed to Wendy, whom he met at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, after three years of dating, life was good for Matthew, and he was looking forward to their wedding in October that very same year. The reason Matthew Pickett's death is particularly notable is due to the fact that his story was presented in a book, Killer Show, written by attorney and author John Barrylick. In it, the lawyer, who represented the family, notes that Pickett's body was found with an audio recorder in his pocket, something that his loved ones presented to the FBI for restoration and as part of the evidence in the subsequent lawsuits that followed. Members of the public and inquisitive freelancers have searched high and low to try and obtain and decipher what was on the audio file. However, Barry Lick was quick to respond by stating that out of respect, the family wished the file to be kept secret, and when probed, replied, it's exactly what you think it would sound like, desperate people burning alive, you don't need to listen to it. One can only imagine the terror and haunting screams for those who alongside Matthew Pickett were panicking, searching for a way out, only to become trapped and suffer the most horrific of deaths. During the legal battle, a short clip was presented and released, which refers to the compensation case of Pickett's friend, Joe Christina. An accompanying photograph shows another of the victims, Jeff Rader, 32, taken by Christina at Pickett's urgent request. In the picture, one can see the stage on fire and people flocking to the visible exits. At this point on the audio, Pickett's voice is heard saying, Joe, take a picture. No one knows for sure how Raider and Pickett met their fate. Christina escaped with severe burns, and those responsible were eventually held to account, including the band's road manager, Daniel Bickley, for the pyrotechnics, and owners of the nightclub, Michael and Jeffrey Dederian. Although many curious people wish to hear the audio file from that night, to unhear such a harrowing loss of life is something that would be more difficult than locating the file itself. The chances of this one being released to the public is very slim. The Al Reno Tornado On the 31st of May 2013, the widest tornado ever recorded was identified in Oklahoma, devastating the region and leaving many wondering what was caught on a recorded video that has never been released to the public. The Al Reno tornado, calculated at 2.6 miles wide, was initially considered a routine day's work for members of the TwistX Storm Chaser team, a well-known group of individuals who were working on behalf of the Discovery Channel to track and trace the wildest of storms. Unfortunately, the trio, which consisted of Tim Samaras, his son Paul, and meteorologist Carl Young, would also become the first storm chasers to die whilst in the middle of a hunt. The purpose of their mission on the day in question was to measure seismic data from within the tornado's atmosphere, having previously tested their equipment on less powerful storms. The technology, known as turtle drones, were developed to aid the chasers in their accumulation of recorded data, and was the task of lead chaser Tim to deploy one of these drones at the foot of the tornado. In the beginning, once the storm was tracked, the team jumped in their Chevrolet Cobalt and pulled up alongside the raging hurricane in the hope of switching to a southern direction, releasing the drone and heading back to safety. However, the mammoth hurricane suddenly changed course and, to the team's shock and horror, steered upwards before coming to a stop directly above them. This type of behavior is considered very unusual due to its sudden change of direction and rapid expansion in size which apparently occurred within the space of 30 seconds, therefore giving the men no chance of escaping its ferocity. The forward motion of Al Reno switched from 20 miles per hour to 55 within a few minutes, and so the Twistex team were trapped with nowhere to go. With death looming, one can only imagine what the men were thinking or saying to one another. As quickly as it descended on the vehicle, Samaras and Carl Young were torn from its interior while Tim was able to remain inside. 
However, this shelter proved to be just as fateful, as once the storm departed, his body was found mangled inside the wreckage. Paul and Carl's bodies were eventually located half a mile away. In the immediate aftermath of the tornado and subsequent search for the team, concerned locals were able to find certain personal belongings, as well as the men's bodies themselves. One of the findings, which appeared in a nearby creek, was a camera that Carl Young used to document the chase. A personal friend of the doomed trio, named Gabe Garfield, was one of only a select few allowed to view the footage in its entirety, and gave a public description of its contents. According to Garfield, Carl Young states clearly that there's no rain around here, and that it's eerily calm, as he films the interior and exterior of the vehicle. The mood quickly turns tense, as Tim is heard saying, actually I think we're in a bad spot, before the video fades to black. Afterwards, all that is captured is Tim repeatedly screaming through the communication radio that we're going to die. One can only imagine the moment that the men realised where they were in comparison to the tornado, and the horrifying sense of dread that would befall them, knowing that the end was near and that there was no way to avoid it. Though another video was recorded by fellow storm hunter Dan Robinson, whose dash cam footage shows the Twist X team driving behind him as he attempted to photograph the entity himself. The contents of Carl Young's camera have never been released. Robinson was able to escape and publicly shared his video online. However, it's an edited version, as he refrains from showing most of the car being struck by the tornado out of respect for the families. The murder of Jun Lin. This next story is extremely brutal and depraved and was the subject of the Netflix documentary, Don't F With Cats. The name of the show is taken from a series of videos that were posted in 2010 by a Canadian man named Luca Magnota, whereby he subjected small kittens to unimaginable torture, leading to their horrible death. The video shocked and disgusted viewers. They are so horrific we will not even describe them here. While unfortunately, 33-year-old student Jun Lin would fall victim to the cat killer, after moving to Canada the very same year that the gruesome videos were posted. Luca was a high school dropout who, having lived through a seemingly troubled childhood, had worked many jobs as a male model, stripper, pornographic actor and escort. Some believe that his fascination with death stemmed from allegedly dating serial killer Carla Homolka, although this is unsubstantiated. Jun Lin was studying computer science and engineering at Concordia University in Montreal and having lived in the country for a few years, was finally looking to connect with someone online. In various posts, Jun Lin spoke of his love for cats, as well as his hope that he would find love after coming out as gay, something that his family heavily frowned upon. Magnota, meanwhile, was posting regularly online under various guises to lure men into his sick fantasy. In 2012, the killer put an ad on Craigslist looking for someone to engage in sexual activity, Lin decided to respond after confirming his interest in Luca, and so the pair met up on the 24th of May. CCTV footage shows the men entering the building where Magnota lived, and was due to carry out his disgusting act. Lin would send a text to his ex that very evening, not knowing what was going to happen to him moments later. The next day, a video titled One Lunatic, One Ice Pick was posted online. In it, Jun Lin is seen tied up whilst Magnota stabs him brutally with an ice pick before dismembering his body and performing various sexual acts upon it. A few hours after the video was uploaded, Magnota booked a round-trip ticket for a flight from Montreal to Paris in an attempt to escape. Unbelievably, authorities dismissed the online sleuths and concerned members of the public, stating that they believed the video to be fake, even though security footage captured him disposing of the body in garbage bags and wearing his victim's clothes. Eventually, on the 29th of May, in Montreal, a janitor called Mike found a suitcase, which had a foul smell emitting from it. Once opened, he found the torso of a man's body inside. Other body parts were sent to political party offices and schools across Canada, all of which belonged to Jun Lin. With the help of the online detectives, whose continuous efforts to connect the dots and track him down, subsequently allowed police to locate Magnota and arrest him at an internet cafe in Berlin on the 4th of June, where he was relaxing and reading stories about himself in the newspaper. 
Luca Magnotto was found guilty of first degree murder in 2014 and sentenced to life in prison at a maximum security complex in Quebec. The video of Jun Lin's murder was uploaded to a gore site in 2012 and apparently YouTube as well, where it was immediately removed. Today, many say that you can only find the real video on the dark web, and even then, many say it's a fake and the original cannot be found. We'd advise you to not go looking for it. Armin Maiwas Tape We'll end this episode with the fifth and final entry, the Armin Maiwas Tape. This one is particularly grotesque in nature, so be warned. On the 9th of March 2001, in the town of Rottenburg, Germany, 39-year-old Armin Maiwes participated in one of the most bizarre and sickening pieces of lost media that has never been released to the public. The IT technician had developed a fascination and sexual fetish for cannibalism and had taken part in numerous online forums under the name Frankie to discuss his fantasies of eating human flesh. Though many would consider these types of online chat sites to be extremely terrifying, those who partake in them claim that it is merely foreplay and or role-playing scenarios that attract them to the discussions. Bernd Brandes was not one of those people. The engineer, who was similar in age to Maiwes, was also interested in taking part in a ritualistic form of cannibalism. However, he wished to be the one who was being eaten. Both men met online through a now-defunct forum, where they discussed their interests and fantasies at length, agreeing to meet and follow through on their shared promise and consent to each other. Upon arrival, Brandes requested that Maiwes bite off his genitals and feed it to him. This, however, proved too difficult, and so it was cut off with a knife. Again, the member was far too difficult to consume, so Maiwes placed it in a pan with some of Brandes' fat and some marinade spices before chopping it up into pieces and eventually feeding it to his dog. Due to the heavy bleeding by Brandes, who still consented to the whole ordeal, Maiwes decided then to place him in a bath and proceeded to feed him painkillers and sleeping tablets before kissing him and stabbing him in the throat, killing him after three hours of depravity. His body was hung in a specially created room and dismembered, thus bringing an end to the disgusting display, all of which was recorded on camera, which had been set up by Maiwes for his own amusement. After bragging about the meeting online, a concerned user reported him to the authorities, and finally in December 2002, one year later, Armin was arrested and is currently serving a life sentence in Kassel prison in Germany. The tape itself was only shown once in court, for which many jurors needed special counselling after viewing its contents. As of today, German authorities have it placed in a special evidence vault with no intention of releasing it to the public. And so that brings us to the end of the video. We hope that this sheds a light on certain subjects and justifies why such content, especially those of a grotesque or sickening nature, continue to remain just that, lost. Thank you for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.